This is the word that inspires, and uh, it'll be the class that you have for the summer. Uh, and you don't have a handout today because you're not going to need it. I'm going to talk uh, about Hosea, talk about Genesis. So let's pray, and then we can begin. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity to be together on this Pentecost Sunday as a church family. I thank you so much for those who are here. And as we look at uh, this great Old Testament uh, book of Hosea and the story that it offers us, and also within the context of the creation story, uh, that we would be reminded how much you love us. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So if you walk away with anything today, my hope is that you'll walk away remembering how much God's, God loves you. So Hosea is a book about God's love for the unlovable. Sociologists have a theory uh, called the looking glass self. You become what the most important person in your life thinks you are. So if the most important person in your life is your wife or your father or your boss, whoever that may be, a teacher, uh, you kind of live into who that person is. Uh, or that person you admire. If you have a crummy father, that probably doesn't work, but it's the most important person, the person you admire and care for. And I wonder, and I often wonder, how much my life would change if I truly believe the Bible's astounding words about God's love for me. If I looked in the mirror and saw what God sees when he looks at me. Brennan Manning tells a wonderful story about an Irish priest who was traveling the countryside and he sees an old peasant sitting by the side of the road. When the priest gets closer, he realizes the peasant is praying and the priest is impressed and he says to the peasant, you must be quite close to God. And the peasant looks up from his prayers and thinks for a moment and then he says, yes, he's very fond of me. <laughs> What if we saw ourselves through God's eyes? So today we're going to get a snippet of a wonderful image of what God looks at when he sees you and when he sees me. It's an intriguing story about betrayal, faithfulness, and the love of God. It comes to us from the book of Isaiah, and here's the text that I want to read uh, for you. Uh, you really need to read the whole book to get it, but here's kind of the crucial text. One, two through 10 from the New International Version. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, Old Testament minor prophet, the Lord said to him, go and marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, the daughter of Diblim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And then the Lord said to Hosea, call her Lo Ruhamah, which means not loved, for I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah and I will save them, not by bow or sword or battle or by horses or horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. After she weaned lo ro Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said to him, call him Lo-Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Are you getting the impression that God's kind of irritated right now? So. <laughs> Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. So here's a fascinating account. Uh, Hosea was a prophet in the mid uh, 8th century BC. And the story begins with this incredible directive of God. He tells them to go for yourself and marry a promiscuous or an adulterous woman. In other words, uh, the match being made in heaven for Hosea was between a godly man and a godless woman. 
What's worse for me is her name is Gomer, which might have done it for me right there. (laughs) Why on earth would God do such a thing? Because God was going to use Hosea's life as a lesson, a kind of living parable, if you will. Hosea represents God and God's love, and Gomer is the symbolic representation of Israel, who in this season, in this season of her relationship with God, has abandoned him, has betrayed him, has turned from his love for them to the Canaanite religion, which was a pagan faith that included things like child sacrifice, and temple prostitution. Israel was in the midst of committing spiritual adultery. So through Hosea and his life, God was going to show his rebellious children how he would deal with that betrayal. Gomer has three children, and once settled into Hosea's home, Hosea, actually this isn't in our story, but Hosea actually turns her out, and nobody would really blame him. And you might think the story has a bad ending. Israelites betray. God turns them out. End of story. In fact, we don't even know if the last two children conceived are conceived by Hosea. All we're told is that she conceived, and we know she's promiscuous and adulterous. But the reason Hosea turns her out is to show her the depths of of her spiritual sickness. He desired not her riddance, when he turned her out, in much the same way God did not want to turn Israel out. didn't want her riddance. He actually wanted her reform, and God wanted uh, Israel's reform. And so, actually, the end of this love story, which is what it is, Hosea actually goes after Gomer, and they reconcile. He takes her back into his own, despite everything she had done, because he loves her. And this, we're told in the book of Hosea, is the way God pursues and turns to those who turn from him. Not abandonment, but pursuit. Not just deserts, but mercy. Not bitter anger and judgment, but compassionate and divine love. The Hebrew word, if you were reading the Hebrew text of Hosea, that's used again and again throughout the book, the Hebrew word has said is used, and literally translated, it means steadfast love. In other words, never-ending, firm, never-failing love. The 14 chapters of Hosea are a remarkable love story. And I would commend the whole book to you. You could read it this afternoon very easily. It's worth your while for sure. But it's not all Cupid's and Valentine hearts. Uh, God is clear to name Israel's spiritual cancer. He's equally clear in saying through Hosea that if one stays on the path of betrayal, it will mean not just spiritual sickness, but spiritual death. But the overriding theme of Hosea is that God never stops loving his children. They may run from him, but he will forever run after them with the hope that they will open their hearts and their lives to them as compassionate lovers do to one another. So what are you to make of this story, this Old Testament story? What are the takeaways? Well, I'm going to lift up just a few. The first is, in fact, a betrayal, uh, not betrayal that may have played itself out In your life, when you read this book, don't think, oh, I'm going to think about all those people who have betrayed me. That's probably an easy list for you to come up with. Uh, I know, and I pray, and I've worked with more people than I can count who've been betrayed in one way or another, business, friendship, marriage. But Hosea gives us the opportunity not to so much look at what others have done to me, but what I might have done to betray God. When have I been spiritually adulterous in my relationship with God? Am I honest enough to say I'm not always the Christian man I should be? And if you're sitting there today and you're not a Christian, although I think as I look at most of you are. But if you're not, stick around after the 1115. I'm happy to talk with you. But if you're out there, uh, can you be honest enough to say that there's something wrong about being disconnected from the one who created me? You may know Douglas Copeland. He is the postmodern literary icon who coined the term Generation X with the novel by the same name. He grew up secular, 
Uh, but in one of his books, he discloses a spiritual quest common to many who are in the secular world. This is what he writes. I love this passage, just from a few years ago. Now, here's my secret. This is Copeland. I tell it to you with an openness of heart that I doubt I shall ever achieve again. So I pray that you're in a quiet room as you hear these words. My secret is that I need God. That I am sick and I can no longer make it alone. I need God to give me, uh, help me give because I no longer seem to be capable of giving. To help me be kind as I no longer seem capable of kindness, to help me love as I seem beyond being able to love. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful, honest statement? My secret is that I need God. Copeland is honest enough to admit not just that he feels ill-suited in a life that abandons God, but that he also deeply needs God to be the person God created him to be. To fail to come to terms with that is to betray God. It is to commit that spiritual adultery. We run after the pagan gods of our modern world thinking they have answer to meet my deep needs, money, pleasure, power, you name it, the old traditional deadly sins. But if we turn God out of the picture, what we thought would bring us what we want really becomes our own undoing. Do you ever feel like that? What's the cure? God's love. God's has said is the cure. Several years ago, I attended a lecture on a college campus uh, by the late playwright Arthur Miller. That lets you know I'm a little older than I might look, but he was there. Uh, And there were a lot of people at this lecture who wanted to be with this literary master. It was an undergraduate group. And I knew for a fact there were a good many undergraduate men who wanted to lay eyes on a man who had been actually married to Marilyn Monroe. So... But he revealed in a bittersweet moment in his marriage to this deeply troubled sex symbol, Marilyn Monroe, in his autobiography, Time Bends, he talks about uh, what happened during the filming of The Misfits. How many of you remember that, one of her last movies, and uh, if not her last movie? And during the filming of that, he watched Marilyn descend into the depths of depression and despair. He began to fear for her life as he watched their growing estrangement and her growing paranoia, and her dependence on barbiturates. And one evening after a physician had been persuaded to give Marilyn yet another shot, and she was sleeping, Miller said he stood over her watching, and this is what he said, I found myself straining to imagine miracles. What if she were able to wait? And I were able to say, God loves you, darling. And she was able to believe it. Not just that I love you, but that she actually believed in that love. Miller was straining to believe what is an eternal truth, that when the love of God catches you, you can be truly healed. So yeah, dealing honestly with our, with my spiritual sickness is one piece of Hosea's story, admitting it, admitting our need for God's healing, But love is a second piece of that story. I flipped up a picture of my my, uh, mentor, the late John R.W. Stott. What a great guy. And if you never read some of John's works, please do so today. They're still stacked this high. Wonderful, precious, humble man. His his book, Basic Christianity, uh, sold throughout the world. Um, I want to say a word about him in a moment, but But we can run from God if we wish. Uh, And the sense of abandonment we feel is not his making, it becomes our own. But the moment, the very moment we stop running is when the spiritual clock begins to work backwards. Our betrayal becomes trumped by God's faithfulness. We may turn and deny and flee his love, but he never stops loving. What does that really look like? Well, our faith displays the links to which God goes to be faithful to his faithless children through patriarchs and matriarchs and ancient judges and kings and prophet after prophet. God spoke of his faithfulness. And when that seemed to fall on deaf ears and stone cold hearts, our Trinitarian God poured himself into the flesh 
of a Jewish babe who grew to be a Nazarene carpenter and in the end gave his life as a ransom for all to show the lengths to which God would extend his love. Even when we nailed that love to the hard wood of the cross, God's love could not be snuffed out. The stone rolled away. Jesus stepped forth for but one reason, to reveal the love of God and to heal our spiritual sickness and death. So again, my mentor, John Stott here, referred to God as the hound of heaven. He liked to say in his love for Jesus, uh, in, that his love for us uh, through Jesus acts like a hound dog, intense and focused in pursuing each of us in a great divine hunt. That image comes to us actually from the poet Francis Thompson, 19th century British poet, who wrote The Hound of Heaven. Thompson uh, was a follower of Christ, but he struggled throughout his life with poverty, with poor health, and with an addiction to opium. And in the depths of his despair, he described his flight from God in this way. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I hid from him and under running laughter, I sped from those strong feet that followed after me. But Thompson knew the unrelenting love of Jesus. He knew the hound of heaven. And in the poem, Jesus pursues Thompson with, quote, unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace deliberate speed, majestic instancy or urgency. He hears the feet of Jesus beating after him as Jesus calls out, all things betray those who betray me. And you and I are also betrayed, I mean, are pursued by the hound of heaven, even in our moments of betrayal. Jesus loves us to be faithful and true and good and noble, but he also knows that often we are not. And so rather than turn us out, he seeks to take us into his kingdom, into his bosom. He pours out his love with the hope that we will come to terms with our spiritual cesspools, stop drinking from their poisonous spiritual waters, so to speak, and instead turn to him the living water who is always there, who never abandons us, who never stops hoping for our return. What does that mean for you and me today? Well, you may be in a place where you're really in a strong relationship with our Lord, but you may have turned from Him for a season, or maybe in one area of your life, or you may never have turned to Him at all. Uh, you may know uh, this fellow, or you may not. Uh, his stage name is Moby. Uh, his full name is Richard Melville Hall. He's the great-great-grandson of Herman Melville, the author of that wonderful classic Moby Dick. Uh, and you, if you know him, you may know that Moby has become a great success in the music world. His 1999, which sounds like ancient history, I know, album Play went platinum. His single Go was named one of the 200 essential rock recordings by Rolling Stone magazine. While successful, Moby's also been controversial not only for his music, but also for his radical Christian faith. A few years back in an interview with Nashville writer Darian Phillip, Moby describes the universal need for God, and this is what he said. One of my favorite quotes is, those who are sick are in need of a doctor. And the sad thing is, we're all sick. It's part and parcel of the human condition. And it's especially part and parcel of living in the United States in the 21st century. We're all sick. We're all deeply unhappy, disconnected, unwell people. We need each other and we need God. And then he says that. And if God made the universe and if God made uh, us and if God made the world, it just makes sense to invite God into our lives and ask him, you made me. So what should I be doing? That's a great quote. What should you and I be doing? If you read through Hosea, what you and I are called to do is admit our betrayal and turn to God's faithfulness and love. Moby is exactly right. If God made the universe, if God made us, it just makes sense to invite God into our lives. Not for a season, but for all time. He's God for goodness sake. He could live anywhere in the universe. He wants. But where does he seek to dwell? More than anywhere in your heart. 
And where does he want you to live? By his side, in his home forever. According to one of Abraham Lincoln's historians, there's a story that one day uh, the man who dons our $5 bill went down to the slave block to buy a slave girl. As he looked at the white man bidding on her, she figured, as she did, she figured that he would simply buy her and then abuse her. He won the bid, and as he was walking away with his property, he said, young lady, uh, you are free. And she said, what does that mean? He said, it means you're free. Uh, Does that mean, she said, that I can say whatever I want to say? And Lincoln said, yes, my dear, you can say whatever you want to say. Does that mean, she said, I can be whatever I want to be? And Lincoln said, yes, you can be whatever you want to be. Does that mean I can go wherever I want to go? And he said, yes, you can go wherever you want to go. And the historian writes that with tears streaming down her face, she looked at Lincoln and said, well, then I will go with you. So what I want to do now is I want to back up a little bit because really the entire story of Hosea is connected to the beginning of our story. And this is a good place to begin since we're beginning a series on the inspiration of Scripture. Uh, Our beginning begins with God. God's initiative to be our God did not begin with Jesus or the prophets or Abraham, but further back, all the way back to the moment of creation. I'm going to borrow a little bit from my friend Max Lucado here uh, and give you somewhat of what that vision might have looked like. So I'm going to kind of melt Max's and my words together, if you'll let me, okay? Um, let me treat this as if I'm reading you a story. Can you, everybody hear me? So God's faithfulness actually began with a choice, a deliberate decision, an informed move. He didn't have to do it. He chose to do it. We don't know when he decided to do it. We can't know because we weren't there. Time was not there. Time did not exist. When did not exist. Nor did tomorrow or yesterday or next time, for there was no time. He chose to create. In the beginning, God created. And with that one choice, history began. Existence became measurable. Out of nothing came light. Out of the light came day. Then the sky. Then the earth. And then he really got to work. Canyons were carved. Oceans were dug. Mountains erupted out of flatlands. Stars were flung. Galaxies were created. Our sun became one of millions. Our galaxy became just one of thousands. Planets were tethered to suns and roared through space at breakneck speed. Stars blazed with head that with at a speed that could melt our planet away in seconds. And the hand behind it all was mighty. He was mighty. And with his might, he created. As naturally as a bird sings, as a fish swims, he created. Just as an artist cannot paint and a runner cannot run, he could not, not create. From the palette of the ageless artist came incredible splendors. Before there was even a person to see it, creation was pregnant with wonder. Flowers didn't just grow, they blossomed. Chicks weren't just born, they hatched. Salmon did not just not swim, they leapt. There was no mundaneness in his universe. And God, you know, if if you can imagine, God must have loved it, must have loved those days of creation. You know, creators relish creating. Can you imagine? Hippo, you're not going to walk. You're going to, you're going to waddle. 
Hyena, you're not going to bark. You're going to laugh. Come over here, panda. I'm going to make you a mask. Come here, giraffe. Let's, Let's stretch out that neck a little bit. And on he went, on he went, giving oceans their their blue, giving trees their sway, giving frogs their leap. He was mighty and he was creative. And he was love. Water must be wet. You can't take the wet out of water. Fire must be hot. You can't take the heat out of fire and still have fire. In the same way, you can't take the love out of this one who lived before time and still have him exist, for he was and is love. The Bible tells us that again and again, love. No bitterness, no evil, no cruelty. Explore every corner, look from every angle, go to the beginning of every decision, and all you'll find is love. Flawless, passionate, vast and pure love. As a result, an elephant has a trunk with which to drink. A kitten has a mother from which to nurse. A kangaroo has a pouch in which to grow. A bird has a nest in which to sleep. The same God who was mighty enough to carve the Grand Canyon, was tender enough to put hairs on the matador fly's legs to keep it warm. The same force that provides symmetry to the planets guides the lips of a newborn to its mother's breast. Because of who he was, he did what he did. He created paradise, a sinless sanctuary, a haven before fear. No time, no death, no hurt. And when he was almost through, he knew it was good, but it was not enough. His greatest work had not yet been completed. One final masterpiece was needed before he could stop. Look to the canyons, see the Creator's splendor. Touch the flowers and and see His delicacy. Listen to the thunder and hear His power. Gaze on His greatest creation and witness all three come together and more. Just imagine a bit more what might have happened that day. Placed one scoop of clay upon another until a form lay lifeless on the ground. And all the garden's inhabitants paused to witness the event, taking a little poetic license, if you'll allow me. Hawks hovered, giraffes stretched, trees bowed, butterflies paused on petals, God says, you will love me, nature, because I made you that way. You will reflect my glory, skies, because that's how you were created. But this one, this one will be like me. This one will be able to choose. And all were silent as the Creator reached into Himself and remove something yet unseen up to that moment. A seed. Choice. And creation stood in silence and gazed upon that lifeless form. And an angel speaks. But what if he, um, what if he chooses not to love? The creator finishes. Well, come, I'll show you. So unbound by the moment, unbound by that particular day, God and the angel walk into the realm of tomorrow. There, see the fruit of the seed of choice, sweet and the bitter. 
And the angel gasped at what he saw, spontaneous love, voluntary devotion, chosen tenderness. Never had the angel seen anything like these. He felt the love of the atoms. He heard the joy of Eve and her daughters. He saw the food and the burdens shared. He absorbed the kindness and marveled at the warmth. Heaven has never seen such beauty, my Lord. Truly, this is your greatest creation. But you've only seen the sweet. Now witness the bitter. And a stench envelops the air. And the angel turns in horror and proclaims, what is that? And the Creator speaks only one word, selfishness. And the angel stood speechless as they passed through centuries of repugnance. Never had he seen such filth. Rotten hearts, ruptured promises, forgotten loyalties, children of creation wandering blindly in lonely labyrinths, Is this the result of choice? The angel asked. Yes. They will forget you? Yes. They will reject you? Yes. They will never come back? Some will. Many won't. What will it take to make them listen? And the Creator walks on in time further and further into the future until He stands by a tree fashioned into a cradle. And even then He could smell the hay that would one day surround His own flesh. And with another step into the future, he paused before another tree. Different tree, taller, standing alone, stubborn ruler of a bald hill. The trunk was thick and the wood was strong. And soon it would be cut and trimmed and mounted on a stony brow of another hill. And soon he himself would be hung on it. And he felt the wood rub against a back he did not yet wear. Will you go down there? The angel asked. I will. Is there no other way? There is not. Wouldn't it be easier not to give them the freedom to choose? It would. The Creator speaks slowly, but to remove choice is to remove love. They looked around the hill and they saw into the future three figures hung on crosses, arms spread, heads fallen. They moan with the wind. Men clad in soldiers' garb sat on the ground near the trio, playing games in the dirt, casting lots for his clothes. Women clad in sorrow huddled at the foot of the hill, speechless faces, tears streaked, eyes downward. One put her arm around another, tried to lead her away. His mother would not leave. I will stay, she whispers. His mother whispers, I will stay. All heaven stands to fight. All nature rises to rescue. All eternity poises to protect, but the Creator gives no command. It must be done, He said. And then withdrew. And as He did, He heard words He Himself would one day cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
and he wrenched at tomorrow's agony. The angel spoke once more, it would be less painful. And the creator interrupted softly, but it wouldn't be love. So together they stepped back into the garden and the maker looked down upon his clay creation. And a monsoon of love swelled up within him. He had died for the creation before he had made him. And God's form bent over the sculptured face and breathed. And dust stirred on the lips of the new one. And the cheeks fleshened. And a finger moved. And the chest rose, cracking the red mud. The eyes fluttered and then opened. But more incredible than the moving of the flesh was the stirring of the spirit. Those who could see the unseen gasped. Perhaps it was the wind that said it first, or maybe it was the star that saw that moment, and such it made the star blink ever since. Maybe it was left to the angel to whisper it. It looks like, it appears so much like. It is him. And the angel wasn't speaking of his face or his features or the body. He was looking at the soul. It's eternal, gasped another angel nearby. Within this first human, God had placed a divine seed, a seed of himself, The God of might had created earth's mightiest. The creator had created not a creature, but another creator. And the one who had chosen to love had created one who could love in return. And at this, he didn't say it is good. He said, it is very good. So you see, he created, but he did so out of his faithfulness. He did so to create a like faithfulness. He did so because he loves you. And God's faithfulness means just this. He created you because He loves you. And as any loving parent would, He gives you the freedom to say and do whatever you want, to be whatever you want to be. That freedom means you can even betray Him. But you and I belong to the one who bought our freedom with His own life. So don't tarry. Don't wait. If you have betrayed, turn back and be restored because you belong to Him. Your rightful place is at His side. It's not slavery to this world that restores us to who we were created to be, to the place we're meant to live. Instead, it's bonding ourselves to Him that puts all the pieces in their rightful place puts you in your rightful place. Just like Gomer's rightful place was back home in the love of her husband, Hosea, your rightful place is in God's home at God's side. And when you stumble and fall and betray again, which you will, don't wallow in that. Let his love pick you up and heal you again. 
Let God walk you to the water's edge and together you toss your betrayal into oblivion so you can walk hand in hand forever in the shadow of his protection found in his divine love. And before long, if you walk that way throughout life's journey, before long you will find a smile on your face and a newness to your heart that means but one thing. My God is very fond of me. So very fond of me. He loves me so. And in that love, you'll become the self you were meant to be, a child of God. So my friends, God has chosen to be faithful to us. What if we chose to see ourselves as God sees us? God has chosen to be faithful. God has chosen to love. And now, it's our choice. Let us by His grace be faithful. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your faithful love. We thank you that you loved us before the very first breath of Adam. And when we betray and when we stumble and when we fall and when we turn, help us to hear your voice saying, I love you. Thank you for choosing to create. Thank you for choosing to be faithful. Thank you for choosing to love. May we choose to live as you have been faithful. May we choose to love as you have loved us. May we choose you and be who we were created to be. In Christ's name. Amen.